Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Cinematic Excrement. And welcome to the 100th episode! 100 episodes and still a lower budget than the average Asylum film. I thought we'd be able to afford a little something more by now, but really all I got to show for all that hard work are a few more posters on the wall. Sad, isn't it? If only there was something I could do to class the joint up a bit. Maybe some fancier lighting, or licensed music, or maybe an explosion. Jesus! Whoa! Whoa, whoa, whoa. Fucking whoa. Okay. I take it back. Just, no, no, no explosions. No. Bad idea. Whew. Anyway, why do I have this? These last 100 episodes have been quite a wild ride. Remember those humble beginnings when I had that crappy webcam, didn't know shit about proper lighting, awkwardly paused after every sentence, and started my show by reviewing Twilight because I was so fucking original? Ah, uh, memories. And for some reason, a good number of you enjoyed watching it. Good to know you people are just as sane as I am. Over the years, I finally got a decent camera, figured out how to light myself like a real boy, got an even better camera, joined Blip, left Blip, watched Blip implode on itself, dressed up like a pirate for no good goddamn reason, lost weight, found it, slowly grew my subscriber count on YouTube to a little over 20,000. Speaking of which, thank you. Fought with YouTube's understandable but annoying policies regarding copyright and advertising, and continued to watch a shitload of bad movies. Some of them enjoyable, some not so much. And of course, I ended up reviewing all of those damn Twilight movies because, well, you start something, you finish it. But at least I got to experience this. <laughs> that is one of the greatest moments in cinematic history. Fight me. So, now that we've come to episode 100, what now? I mean, with a milestone like this, I can't just review any bad movie, now can I? No, I need to do something special, something legendary. But what? I've already done Birdemic, both of them. I've done Battlefield Earth, I've done Manos the Hands of Fate. I just did a Fifty Shades movie, and honestly, I need time to recover before I do another one. And I don't really feel like doing the Star Wars prequels, because honestly, I don't think there's anything I can say that Mr. Plinkett didn't say already. But you know, there is one filmmaker whose work I have not yet touched. A man who is legendary for all the wrong reasons. A man whose incompetence was only matched by his enthusiasm. I think it's about time we looked at a movie from Edward D. Wood Jr. I don't know how it took me a hundred episodes to get to this guy, but better late than never, eh? If anyone belongs in the pantheon of so bad it's good movies, it's Ed freaking Wood. This man is a fascinating character. It seems like he had such a deep appreciation for the art of filmmaking, but didn't fully understand any aspect of it. He had ambition, but rarely had the funding to fully bring his visions to life. Not that this ever dissuaded him, mind you. Oh no, nothing could ever dissuade this man from following what he believed was his true calling. And I think that's why he is such a beloved character in Hollywood's history, despite the fact that he never made anything even close to what could be considered a good movie. He was just so goddamned earnest. Plenty of filmmakers are known for making critically panned movies. Some of them are controversial figures at best, and some are just downright hated because they're assholes. But Ed Wood is different. He made stinker after stinker to be sure, but the earnestness with which he made said stinkers brings forth a certain charm that other bad filmmakers are lacking. And I think that's why he stood the test of time, despite his utter lack of talent. You can tell he truly loved what he was doing. And while he may have failed as a mainstream filmmaker, he failed in the most memorable and spectacular ways. And while he has a reputation for being the worst filmmaker of all time, he even received an award for this honor, I do not agree with that assessment. He was incompetent and his films are terrible, I'm not disputing that, but as far as I'm concerned, the worst type of movie you can make and the worst type of filmmaker you can be is one that is boring, bland, and forgettable. 
There are many words one could use to describe Ed Wood. Boring, bland, and forgettable are not among them. So unlike some other movies I've reviewed that have been major slugs, this promises to be fun. But the million dollar question is, well, hang on, this is Ed Wood we're talking about. He never had a budget that high. The $50,000 question is, if I'm going to review an Ed Wood movie, what movie should I review? He's made all sorts of schlock, sci-fi, horror, exploitation, and in his later years, porn. Well, though it may seem an obvious choice given that it's probably his most famous film, today I'll be taking a look at... Night of the Ghouls. Nah, I'm just kidding. We're doing Plan 9. Plan 9 from Outer Space was once dubbed the worst movie ever made. I can only assume the person who gave it that distinction had never seen Manos. Nevertheless, Plan 9 is pretty terrible, but it's the best kind of terrible. This is grade A so bad it's good material. So what are we waiting for? Let's dive in. This is Plan 9 from Outer Space. The movie opens with a nonsensical introduction from Jaron Criswell King, a psychic of sorts who went by the stage name The Amazing Criswell. He was a bizarre character, with a flamboyant stage presence and a tendency to sleep in coffins, which I suppose made him a perfect fit for the world of Ed Wood. Criswell was known for making wild and outlandish predictions about the future. He claimed London would be destroyed by a meteor in 1988, and Denver by some other outer space phenomenon the year after. He claimed Mae West would be elected president of the United States, and non-pedigreed dogs would rise up and form a union due to what they felt was discrimination in favor of pedigreed dogs. While there were some who believed he was a real psychic, by most accounts he never claimed this was true, and his predictions were ridiculous by design. However, Every once in a while, he would get one right. During an appearance on the Jack Parr program, he claimed President Kennedy would not seek re-election in 1964 because something would happen to him in November of 1963. Did anyone else just shit themselves a little? Anyway, Criswell's appearance in this movie is about as odd as Criswell himself. He begins by, appropriately, talking about the future. We are all interested in the future, for that is where you and I are going to spend the rest of our lives. True, unless the government lends me some plutonium. And remember, my friend, future events such as these will affect you in the future. Thank you, Captain Obvious. But then, after all that talk about the future, he speaks as if what we are about to see is an account of events that have already transpired. We are bringing to you the full story of what happened on that fateful day. On that fateful day in the future? Let us punish the guilty. Let us reward the innocent. What guilty? What innocent? Is this a criminal investigation now? What in God's name are you talking about, Chris? Can your heart stand the shocking facts about grave robbers from outer space? Fun fact, that was the original title of the movie. But Wood's Southern Baptist backers considered the idea of grave robbers to be a sacrilege, and they made him change it. So grave robbers became Plan 9. What are plans one through eight? I have no idea. After Criswell's pointless rambling, we are presented with a funeral. I assume they're mourning the loss of the dignity of everyone involved with the making of this film. And here we're introduced to the legendary Bela Lugosi in what would end up being his final role. Wood met Lugosi a few years prior and the two quickly became close friends. At the time, Lugosi's film career was all but over and he was struggling with drug addiction. And Wood offered him roles in his early films Glenn or Glenda and Bride of the Monster. They had also shot what was most likely test footage for another film called Tomb of the Vampire, but they never had the chance to actually make the film as Lugosi passed away in 1956. After Lugosi's passing, Wood decided he would honor his late friend by making what would technically end up being Bela Lugosi's last movie. He would incorporate all of the test footage he shot of Lugosi for Tomb of the Vampire into Plan 9 from Outer Space, whether it made sense or not. And largely, it did not. 
As the footage was never actually intended to be used in an actual movie, it's all over the place. There's a scene of Lugosi attending the aforementioned funeral, several shots of him walking around outside a house, and him doing his Dracula thing in a makeshift cemetery. There's one really bizarre moment where Lugosi walks out of the woods and just stands there looking like an idiot for a moment before finally spreading his cape. The most talented filmmaker in the world would have trouble getting a coherent story out of this test footage that was clearly never supposed to see the light of day. So you can imagine what a struggle it must have been for Mr. Wood. Now there is some debate over what Wood's true intentions were in incorporating this footage of Lugosi in Plan 9. And admittedly, I can see how it would appear that he was exploiting Lugosi's name in order to attract attention to the film. After all, who wouldn't at least be curious about Bela Lugosi's last movie? But while I'm sure Wood was definitely aware that Lugosi's name recognition could help the film, by all accounts their friendship was genuine, so I can buy that he was actually trying to make a loving tribute to his fallen friend. It seems to me his intentions were good, though I can't say the same for the execution. Anyway, the story, such as it is, for Lugosi's character is his wife has just passed away, and Criswell proceeds to narrate his grief in the most overdramatic fashion possible. The ever-beautiful flowers she had planted with her own hands became nothing more than the lost roses of her cheeks. Careful, Chris, you're gonna choke on all that ham. Either due to his grief or his annoyance at Chriswell's narration, Bella inadvertently wanders into a sound effect of oncoming traffic and is killed. And so another funeral is held, this time in a crypt that even in black and white I can tell is made out of cardboard. I know this movie didn't have much of a budget, Wood only had around $60,000 to work with, which would be about half a million in today's money. But if you can't afford to make a decent looking crypt, just don't make the crypt! There is no reason why he had to be in a crypt. It adds nothing to the story, especially when it looks so incredibly fake. What do you know? Haven't you heard of suspension of disbelief? Oh, shut up, pre-problematic Johnny Depp. No one's talking to you. Why was his wife buried in the ground and he sealed in a crypt? Something to do with family tradition, a superstition of some sort. Oh. The men in the family were buried in refrigerator boxes while their wives were buried in the woods behind the director's house. It's tradition, what are you gonna do? By the way, if you're hoping the acting gets better as the movie goes on, ooh boy, do I have some bad news for you. For about 95% of the movie, this is pretty much as good as it gets. There are a few, I don't know if I would call them bright spots, but at least they were moderately illuminated spots. Paul Marco, who stars as a cowardly patrolman that I affectionately refer to as Officer Bumblefuck, actually plays a halfway decent comic relief character. And Wood somehow managed to rope Lyle Talbot into playing a military general. I guess his Ozzy and Harriet paychecks hadn't cleared yet. But most of the acting in this film is pretty bad. And again, I know the budget didn't exactly allow Wood to be picky when it came to choosing actors. But my god, some of these people just aren't even trying. They're not performing, they're just reading their lines. Literally, in some cases. See this co-pilot? That's the script in his lap. Oh yeah, we should talk about this cockpit set. You know... I remember way back when I was a wee lad, my fourth grade class had to put on a Christmas play. As you might expect from an elementary school play, we had pretty much no budget to work with. And somehow our sets still looked more realistic than this. Good lord, I have so many questions. First of all, has Ed Wood ever seen the inside of an airplane cockpit? And second, seriously, has he? because I think a child's crayon drawing of an airplane cockpit would look more realistic than this. At least they wouldn't draw the yoke as a cardboard half circle. Now, in fairness, I should point out that the visibility of the co-pilot script and this brief shadow of the boom mic were not entirely Wood's fault. Plan 9 was shot in open mat, and when it was briefly shown in theaters, it was cropped for widescreen. But many years down the road, when Plan 9 was released on home video, it was rendered in full frame, thus exposing items that the director never intended the audience to see. So I can't really blame Wood for the script and the boom mic being visible here because were we viewing the film as he intended, they wouldn't be. And honestly, there are plenty of problems with Plan 9 that were legitimately Wood's fault. 
we don't need to blame him for things that were beyond his control. Anyway, the pilot in this cockpit, the one who's not reading the script, is our hero of sorts, Jeff Trent, played by Gregory Walcott. He was living a perfectly ordinary life until one day, out of the freaking blue, a flying saucer showed up. <laughs> oh, Jesus. What in the world? That's nothing from this world. Sure it is. They got it at the toy shop down the street. Somehow, as soon as the plane lands, the pilots and the flight attendants get grabbed by the military and they are sworn to secrecy. So naturally, as soon as Jeff gets home, he immediately starts blabbing about the whole thing to his wife. He's stupid like that. Last night I saw a flying object that couldn't have possibly been from this planet. But I can't say a word. I'm muzzled by army brass. And if I do say a word, they're gonna kill me and everyone I've told. So basically, by telling you this, I've just condemned you to death. Well, what's for dinner, honey? And as if the totally real flying saucer wasn't bad enough, the dead are rising from their graves, including this scary-looking woman played by Myla Nurmi, credited under her stage name, Vampira. And her first act is to kill these gravediggers, who are also the movie's producers. And I'm sure she's not the first person in Hollywood who's wanted to kill their producers. But there's a problem with this scene. Aside from the fact that we never actually see her kill anyone, we just hear a scream and fade to black and we're supposed to assume that something bad happened. Did she strangle them? Did she claw them to death with those nails? Did they just shit out their own intestines in fear? I don't know, but that's not the important thing. The important thing is, according to Criswell's narration, she is the wife of Bella Lugosi's character. I'm tempted to call bullshit on that because of the 40-year age gap. Then again, Lugosi once married a 19-year-old when he was in his 50s, so perhaps it's not so far-fetched after all. But that's not the problem. In this scene, Vampira is the very woman that these gravediggers just buried moments ago. And after they buried her, they heard a weird noise and started walking away. And as they are walking away from the grave in which they buried Vampira, they ran into Vampira. Which means that woman somehow rose up from her grave, dusted herself off, there's not a speck of dirt on her, looped around and got in front of them, all in the span of about 10 seconds. I don't care if that woman was an Olympic sprinter during her life, there is no fucking way! Once the bodies are found, the police are sent to the scene and somehow they leave the department at night, arrive at the cemetery during the day, and then when they get out of their car, it's night again. My god. The aliens have altered the rotation of the Earth. They're screwing with the laws of space and time! It's the end of the world! Save yourselves! Or, you know, the director just fucked up again. This happens so many times throughout the movie that I'm not going to bother to point them all out or we'll be here all day. The cemetery itself is obviously shot on a soundstage and made to look like nighttime, but almost all of the outdoor shots were filmed during daylight. I'm guessing one of two things happened. Either Eddie was just too stupid to realize that would be a major continuity gaffe, or those outdoor shots were intended to be day for night and were just never processed as such in the lab. Either because they ran out of money, or they just forgot. The end result is confusing and amusing. So this mountain of a man is Inspector Daniel Clay, played by Tor Johnson, a former professional wrestler who later got into acting. Wood previously featured him in his movie Bride of the Monster as the mute assistant to a mad scientist. And it was really a perfect role for him. Pretty much all he had to do was look like a dangerous monster. And he did. I would not want to run into a guy like that in a dark alley. Or indeed anywhere else. But while he does eventually play a zombie in this movie, his character starts out very much alive. And for some strange reason, Wood decided to actually give him lines. Probably a mistake considering his thick Swedish accent. Have one of the boys take the guy and the girl back to town. You take shots. Okay, Inspector. What are you going to do? Knock around the well. Knock around the well? What? No disrespect to Mr. Johnson intended, but why would you give a speaking part to a man who can't speak clearly? I mean, sure, they did the same thing with Andre the Giant and the Princess Bride, but I will give that a pass because Andre the Giant is awesome and I will hear nothing to the contrary. But anyway, is it possible that they intended to loop Johnson like they originally did with Schwarzenegger in Hercules in New York, but somehow never got around to doing it? Or did Wood actually think this would fly as is? 
because every time he speaks, I feel like there should be subtitles. And I know he's speaking English. Anyway, while Clay is knocking around the well, he eventually runs into Vampira and... Oh dear. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. No one can be blamed for this one but Ed Wood himself. Since he didn't have enough footage of Bela Lugosi for a full movie, he resorted to hiring a double, his wife's chiropractor if you can believe it, and had him cover his face the whole time. And you know, apart from being taller and younger and not looking anything like him at all, he's a dead ringer for Bella. Yeah, this is just inexcusable. Come on, Eddie. I know you wanted to pay tribute to your fallen friend, but there is no way you could have looked at this footage and thought, oh yeah, everyone will totally believe that this guy who looks nothing like Lugosi and is covering his face for no reason is actually Lugosi. Hello everyone, I'm Leonardo DiCaprio. Surprise, I'm really not. Wait, what's that? You say you weren't surprised? Ah, well you see, that's because you have eyes. So Clay finds himself caught between Vampyra and not Bella Lugosi and is unaware that you're supposed to shoot zombies in the head. And apparently they stare at him to death. He's found by his fellow officers who... don't seem all that surprised that he's dead. That's odd. Eh, he was 300 pounds. If the zombies didn't get him, he was gonna die of a heart attack sooner or later. Hey, do we have a really big cardboard crypt we can bury this guy in? Um, Lieutenant, this is just a suggestion, but maybe pointing your gun directly into your shoulder while your finger is on the trigger isn't the best idea. He does this all throughout the movie, too. He's waving that thing all over the place. I know it's just a prop, but you're not supposed to act like it's a prop. That's not how acting works. Inspector Clay's dead, murdered, and somebody's responsible. Well, yeah, that's generally how murder works. And of course, it's not long before Clay rises from the gr Oh, well, wait, he's slipping. He's slipping, he's losing it. Okay, there he goes. Rises from the grave. And lack of balance notwithstanding, the guy actually makes a pretty scary zombie. Tor was born to either play monsters or be a professional wrestler. And he was both. So, will our hero survive this nightmare? Who is behind the dead rising from their graves? And will the special effects ever get any better? The answers to these questions will be revealed right now. Yes, aliens, and... <laughs>